So one theory said that um, a special separation can afford Earth to produce sugar, for example, and then uh, nitrogen bases were brought by uh, comets falling on Earth. Uh, but nowadays, we think that a temporal separation on Earth is more reasonable uh, with respect to a spatial separation, as I have already defined it. And uh, we think that uh, on Earth, first, the hydrogenic acid chemistry appeared, and then when it has stopped, when all the hydrocenic acid was uh, uh, used for the production of uh, uh, nitrogen bases and amino acid, only at this time the chemistry of sugar can take uh, place. This theory was um, is much more reasonable because uh, insufficient material can be carried by comets, and this material differently from water that is highly resistant to impact the radiation, uh, amino acids and nitrogen bases are really uh, sensitive to, uh, to impact the radiation. They will burn when a comet falls on Earth. So uh, thinking that they can be um, brought on Earth by comets is um, quite unreliable. Uh, the theory of uh, temporal separation on Earth is based on the concept of molecular reservoir. It is to say a molecule that could um, entrap, for example, the building block for sugars, uh, formaldehyde and uh, ammonia as well, in a way, but formaldehyde in particular, and then release it only on a, in a second time. And a molecule that can have had this um, potential significance is HMT. HMT is hesimethylene tetramine. Hesimethylene tetramine can be formed in primordial or entrapping formaldehyde and uh, being stable in this pH and radiation condition. And when all the hydrocenic acid that took part and all the nitrogen bases and amino acid was formed, the condition on Earth changed, for example, changed the pH of the primordial soup, changing the pH, uh, HMT is become unstable and would have released a lot of formaldehyde, giving rise to the uh, sugars chemistry at this time. Uh, we must take in mind that uh, starting from the concept that we find some building blocks so we can re uh, directly pass to uh, a living organism, um, we can fall in the Pantheon syndrome. If we have a very, very complex structure, such as the Pantheon, and we found somewhere in the universe just a few, few bricks as building blocks, we can say that so in this universe in which we have found bricks, we must surely have a Pantheon because Pantheon is made of bricks and we on Earth we have um, a pantheon made of bricks because it's a, a simplistic uh, way of thinking. At the same time, if we have on Earth, on, on comets, um, amino acids or uh, nitrogen bases, we can't uh, just think that all we have all the um, ingredients to make uh, life begin. So we absolutely must have life beginning in uh, this condition. And this is quite astonishing. Uh, here is some um, supposed uh, uh, scientist, such as uh, uh, this one cited on Amperuma that uh, said that uh, as radio astronomers have discovered the vast rate of organic molecules in the interstellar medium, we are led to the inescapable conclusion that life must be commonplace in the cosmos. It's not absolutely true. It's true that we have a building block for creating life 
all over in the universe. But we can say that everywhere in the universe, life has begun just because we have a brick. Just because we have a brick is not sure that we have a pantheon as well. Um, all these uh, studies based on both Miller experiment and uh, in particular of cometary uh, simulation experiment have some uh, uh, other problems, such as, uh, for example, uh, the analysis were targeted to like compound so in the way uh, polymers completely escape this analysis and this classification because polymers are really, really difficult to analyze. We have polymers, so we have um, random polymers called tolines, but we, there's Polymers have nothing to do to, with prebiotic chemistry, at the best of our knowledge. And it, they are very, very, very difficult to, to analyze and to classify. So for this reason, we analyze usually only very, very light compounds. Uh, in particular, when we use a uh, radio telescope to analyze what is happening uh, billions of uh, years light ago from uh, the Earth, we base on uh, um, ambiguous analytical data and sometimes also to older mission with old instruments that are not so performant as nowadays instruments. This uh, condition leads up to the conclusion that it is very difficult to know primordial condition and that it is impossible to simulate the primordial complexity as well because there are uh, problems lead, uh, about the composition, the long time and too many components. When we perform prebiotic experiments in the laboratory, we use simple mixture of five, six, 10 compound, but we can't use uh, 20 or 100 different supposed prebiotical compound because um, we could, we are not able to analyze the mess we obtain from this compound reacting. We must choose a small amount of reactants, a reduced number, number of reactants hydrocyanic acid, ammonia, formaldehyde, urea, and so on, but we can mix everything we found together just to simulate the complexity of the primordial soup because we are not able to analyze the resulting mixture. Uh, so what we can do in the laboratory Moreover, in laboratory, we have not one million years, million years to perform the experiment while we have some days or at least some weeks. Uh, so the best approach nowadays used is to mix um, substances, not lo just looking at uh, what they are, uh, formaldehyde, uh, urea or ammonia. We are looking more to the ratio between carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. But are the building block of uh, all the living organisms and all the living matter as well. Uh, but we, we base our supposition of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen ratio, uh, basing on carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen ratio that we found nowadays. We don't know what is this rate, what was this ratio billions of years ago. So we just infer, as I told you later, what was this ratio and simulate a prebiotic mixture using this uh, approach. And we can use uh, as well prebiotic uh, compound, uh, choosing uh, um, compound that were reasonably presents in the prebiotic atmosphere. So we can't use directly a, an RNA molecule, but we will use uh, sugars, for example, or phosphonic acid, or something similar. But uh, we we must choose carefully the compound uh, used to obtain something that is uh, uh, that has something to do with the real world and that uh, the real world that was billions of uh, uh, years ago. We are in a way. Uh, 
mm, lucky because uh, prebiotic compounds are at minimum of energy. So that they are, they, they are obtained in different ways and started starting with different compounds. As I said, for example, amino acid can be obtained both from ammonia and uh, carbonylic compound and both from uh, hydrocenic acid. Moreover, the source of energy is important, but uh, in a way not so much because, uh, uh, for example, we can obtain the same compounds also with different yields, naturally, with photochemistry and with thermal chemistry. So, um, for the reason I said, because prebiotic compounds are at the minimum of energy and they are favored among all the compounds we can consider. Um, we must uh, consider that all si the synthesis proposed by, by us as chemists are chemomimetic synthesis. Uh, in fact, biological product as first presented in the probiotic world must be easily accessible chemically because enzyme came later. So, um, we, we must produce a chemistry not using enzyme and using a, a chemical approach more than a biochemical approach at first, at least for the first time of developing of prebiotic uh, chemistry. So that the prebiotic biochemistry that just followed the first step of prebiotic chemistry was very simple because it could not involve all the complexity of enzyme that, for example, we have nowadays operating in the living system and in us as well. Um, we could take in mind that early life forms evolves very, very quickly, perhaps due also uh, to the inhospitable condition in which they, uh, they developed. We must consider that uh, life um, is very, very robust, much more than we can think. In fact, we, we have nowadays, also nowadays, bacteria that can live at extreme pH, and uh, I mean uh, extremely acidic, zero, or extremely basidic, 10. As well, we have uh, um, bacteria that lives in uh, a very high, at very high temperature, uh, or at very low temperature. We call the uh, living uh, organism extremophile. So as we have nowadays extremophile, so we would have had at the time of prebiotic chemistry extremophile. However, the pressure imposed by the stringent condition of pH, temperature, and uh, pressure as well, would have led to a very, very um, uh, quick evolution of uh, this form. Another problem that living organism had to, to deal with was the oxygenation of Earth oceans and then of atmospheres. Coming back to the first living organism and first living fingerprinting uh, seen, as I've said, in 3.8 billion years ago, uh, I must uh, say that the, this first evidence were found in um, stones called stromatolites. These stromatolites are a mixture of uh, um, rock and uh, bacteria that grow together. And the oldest one date 3.6 billion of years ago. Uh, for the sake of curiosity, in some areas of the world, the stromatolites are still being formed today. The bacteria involved in the first stromatolites were anaerobic ethrotropes. This means that they um, lived in the absence of oxygen, of oxygen being anaerobic. And being ethrotropes, they don't make their food by themselves, but 
they use the abundance of organic molecules available in the primordial soup to grow and to develop. They did not produce the food. The case in which an organism produces part of its food is the, in the autotrophic case, while stromat bacteria involved in stromatolite, first bacteria, were heterotroph. When uh, the organic molecules in the primordial soup become scarce, so photosynthetic organisms that produce are autotrophic and produce their food by themselves took part. When this bacteria took part, um, the photosynthesis uh, happened. And the first photosynthetic organism, the uh, first autotrophic photosynthetic organism that were reasonably the purple and green sulfur bacteria, used uh, um, hydrogen sulfide as an hydrogen donor. So in this way, they did not produce oxygen, but just uh, before, just uh, after this, cyanobacteria um, used uh, water as an hydrogen donor and not hydrogen sulfide, so that they release oxygen in the environment. As water was much more abundant with respect to hydrogen uh, sulfide, cyanobacteria uh, took part rapidly and uh, there was a real uh, explosive growth of this uh, bacteria 2.5 billions of years ago. So that uh, at this period, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere dramatically uh, increases from much or less from zero to um, several point percent. This is seen in particular by the formation of a banded iron formation in uh, um, uh, in um, in oceans rocks. Before 2.5 billion years ago, we observed the formation of rocks in which iron is in the bivalent uh, oxidation state, so it is a reduced iron. But before, after 2.5 billion years ago, iron in uh, um, in oceans rock is iron free oxidized iron oxidized iron as a, a red color with respect to the uh, greenish color of uh, reduced iron so when we observed this formation in the oceans and we date this uh, formation 2.5 billion years ago, we can say that absolutely at that time, oxygenation of the oceans and then of the atmosphere become increasingly a problem. Why it become a problem? At first it become a problem because oxygen is toxic to the organism. We don't have protective mechanism. Now we, we use oxygen to live, but uh, uh, non uh, but other organ, anaerobic organism found oxygen as a toxic element, as nowadays uh, anaerobic bacteria can grow in an oxygenation environment. They die rapidly. And the oxygen not only is toxic to the organism, but uh, creating an oxidizing atmosphere, oxygen can destroy precious reduced the organic molecules that were the food of prebiotic uh, organisms. So uh, a double way of being toxic of oxygen, directly uh, killing uh, the organism and killing their food stuff as well. Uh, when the amount of oxygen in the atmospheres and in the ocean become huge, um, some anaerobic organism 
the, well, some anarchic organisms survive in an environment, in a unique environment with little of or no oxygen. And this is uh, true also today in some um, uh, ocean uh, condition. Anaerobic organisms are still alive and they still use sulfur as a source of uh, um, Reduct, reduction compound, but some organisms evolved adapting to the presence of oxygen. And when the amount of oxygen become increasing in height, this uh, organism uh, took, uh, 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 Take a uh, took over with respect to the other organism which uh, died in the presence of, uh, um, of, uh, of oxygen. And moreover, some organisms developed a mean to use oxygen, not only to detoxify oxygen, but to use oxygen in respiration to extract more energy from the food. So they get an advantage on using oxygen air, they evolved being, uh, for example, nowadays aerobic organism. The presence of oxygen in uh, the atmospheres also create uh, another very interesting and important condition because oxygen in the high atmosphere become ozone and then ozone layers will uh, have formed uh, at the time, ozone provide protection from the UV radiation of the Earth's surface, thus allowing life to expand uh, near to the Earth's surface because this um, high UV bombardment that uh, at the first time led to a rapid evolution of the prebiotic molecules and of the first organism, uh, creating an evolutionary pressure on them, then become rapidly toxic. Uh, you know that uh, um, exposing a surface to UV light will kill everything that is uh, living on this surface. And so the formation of a ozone layer uh, allow the organism to shift, for example, from the ocean, where they are protected from the UV light by the water, from to the rocks, where they are not protected by water from the action of UV light. But when ozone was present, they were protected from UV light just by the presence of ozone themselves. But how uh, this building block uh, organized uh, to create uh, the first organism uh, that uh, took a part uh, during the course of the uh, evolution? Several theories were proposed. Uh, the milestone proposed by chemists and uh, biologists uh, always uh, also are the theory of Pasteur, we uh, refuse the uh, spontaneous generation. Before uh, uh, Pasteur, people thought that uh, microorganisms could spontaneously generate or, uh, in an env environment also without uh, a seed of the organic uh, microorganism and so on. Pasteur uh, refute and confute spontaneous generation. Then Svante and Renius in the 20th century proposed panspermia, but panspermia is not a way to solve the problem because it just shifts the problem. According to panspermia, first the living organism uh, were not formed on the old surface, but were bring to Earth by meteorite, for example, from Mars, I say, or from another planet. But this shifted the problem in, in, in no more because, well, so how life can be gone on Mars, on, on the meteorite. You say that life was brought on Earth by the meteorite, but the life was originated on the meteorite. So in what way, in this, um, this way, uh, Svantarinus theory is not uh, uh, very useful to solve the problem of uh, prebiotic chemistry. The, um, uh, 
Then uh, the heterotropic theory and the autotropic theory, as I proposed to you, uh, to part, uh, in part because Oparin uh, spoke and wrote a, uh, a lot of articles about uh, them. So all this has to do with uh, the formation of the prebiotic compound on the Earth's surface. But these uh, compounds should arrange in a life in a life form. Also, if I have said that it's difficult or impossible to, to say what life is, nevertheless, we can say something about it just to simplify the problem or to identify uh, the problem itself. And we can say that the living stru structure is an organized structure with metabolism, which can reproduce and can evolve by natural selection. Having a metabolism means that an organism should uh, be a thermodynamically open system can, that can produce complex molecules starting from simple molecules. So in a way, say that an organism as a metabolism is uh, to say that it is autotrophic in a way. So living organisms, as we know them, uh, are nowadays autotrophic. And first, really living organism can be considered in this way autotrophic. Moreover, I have spoke of reproduction. Reproduction means genetic inheritance and variability, and the balance between coping fidelity and variability, so that an unlimited possibility of combination is created that can led uh, with the uh, evolution of the species, as Darwin uh, explained us, to all the living organisms nowadays present and that uh, we uh, know. But having genetic material and metabolism is not sufficient to have a living organism. In fact, I thought uh, metabolism uh, imply a thermodynamically open system. Nevertheless, we must have a cell membrane that separates the living organism from the, the environment. Because uh, uh, in, in other case, we can't speak of a living organism which is defined and delimited in space and time. And if it's not delimited in space and time, with birth and death, we can say it's a living organism as well. All this consideration um, led to the, the hypothesis that starting from a chemical evolution, we go through a prebiological selection and then from a uh, biological selection when we had the first real living organism, whatever living organism means. All the um, complex of metabolism, inheritance, and membrane, as I have explained to you, were uh, put together in the concept uh, proposed by Ganti of chemoton. Chemoton is the simplest organism. We, uh, we don't say or what is doing what in this uh, uh, organism. I don't say it has a Krebs cycle, it has a membrane uh, made of phospholipides uh, or so on. I don't say nothing about uh, the real nature of the comp and the composition and the metabolic pathway of this organ. I don't know. Ganti just said the first living organism was organized on this tray building semiles in the, on this three milestone metabolism inheritance membranes and proposed a sort of uh, system uh, the most simple system possible which has this three element part together uh, starting from uh, the on the concept of chemotone during the times we had theories that emphasize one or more of these aspects. More or less, we can say that um, all the theories uh, were focused on metabolism or inheritance. There are a really uh, a small number of theories that start speaking of membranes as a uh, building and the milestone in the development of the living organism. And 
Speaking of metabolism, we can start from one very old theory, just you will see it, I am sure, with Professor Donny. Uh, the theory is operant theory. I will give you just some basic, very, very, very basic concept. Don't worry if it is a little confused to uh, the knowledge you have nowadays, but because you will uh, study it uh, much more with next lessons, absolutely. Uh, operant theory emphasizes the origin of metabolism. And uh, uh, according to this uh, theory, um, primordial growth in a reducing uh, atmosphere led to the formation of aggregates of prebiotic material, the operant called Co-shervate, co shervates were open system. Um, they are um, blocks of chemicals all together, uh, balls of chemicals in a way, uh, more or less separated from a, a surrounding environment, not well separated from a surrounding environment, um, which can produce some molecules due to a uh, rough metabolism. This co-ashervate evolved under a chemical evolution pressure so that better and more evolved co-ashervate could organize in space and time, growing and then reproducing. Only when this co-ashervate that, that have a metabolism could grow significantly, then they uh, developed an uh, inheritance uh, method to uh, reproduce themselves. At first, they reproduced basing just on enzyme and chemical reaction, not based on genes and classical inheritance, as we spoke about it now today. Um, Connected to the operin theory, uh, there is an interesting theory that you will absolutely study in the next uh, time, the next way, the next lessons. That is the hypothesis that an early Earth, the, um, uh, the first genetic material was not RNA or DNA, such as it is uh, actually, but uh, the first genetic material was PNA, where PNA stands for peptide nucleic acids. So this aggregate as proposed by Oparin, for example, would produce and reproduce themselves based on an peptide skeleton rather than on a RNA or DNA skeleton. And uh, uh, the reason is that uh, uh, in a probiotic environment, a, um, a polymer based on peptides is much more easily formed with respect to a polymer uh, based on RNA or DNA because some uh, amino acid uh, go through possible spontaneous polymerization where exposed to quite hot temperatures such as uh, uh, 100 degree, but uh, this is not the case, for example, for RNH with degradates in those uh, um, conditions. In other theories that was proposed um, after operating theory is the so-called Cairns-Smith theory, based on the names of the author that proposed it. Uh, according to Cairns-Smith, microscopic mineral crystals in the clay were the original genetic material. We spoke of stromatolite, that is an uh, aggregate of minerals. And then Cairns-Smith said, um, these minerals, was the real genetic material uh, in presence uh, in the prebiotic world. The superficial layers of, the, of this inorganic material govern the growth of other inorganic layers, which gradually separate in a replication way. So the first living organism, according to K. Smith, were inorganics were stones, if you want. 
organic material present in the primordial soup was initially just an adjuvant that furnished the mechanical support and favored the capture of ions present in the primordial soups so that this inorganic ion were captured and brought to the minerals layers so that the mineral layers could grow and aggregate replicating in the way I described to you. Uh, these organic materials that at first was a chaperone for um, um, for ions presents in the primordial soup, then in a later stage become autonomous and become the real living organism as we know them nowadays. The clay minerals acted as a catalyst and as a scaffold on which the organic compound can build. And this organic compound bound to the clays could evolve under a chemical pressure, creating much more uh, advanced forms that took part over a primordial forms of living organisms and then evolved in cells and genes also in a later stage, uh, of course. According to Ken Smith, the first genetic material was not PNA, neither DNA, but was rather RNA because uh, due to um, particular question related to the fact that some RNA molecules could also act as enzyme, the so-called ribozyme, so that RNA is uh, the just matching point between enzyme and gene. For this reason, case me thought that RNA is the real first genetic material. Uh, several other scientists speculated over on these theories and uh, in particular Ferris um, in the last part of the 20th century proposed and uh, exposed the theory of how this RNA could uh, take part over uh, the inorganic world that the first I described. The first inorganic uh, shelves uh, that um, we're, we are speaking about were based on cow limit and similar structure that we found in stromatolite, as I have told to you. And um, we can go on speaking uh, of Walter Schelzer theory. Water shows that theory is an evolution of a previously theory. Uh, according to Walter Schuzer, um, chemolithotrophic metabolism uh, happened not on stromatolite on the, or on kaolinite, but rather on pyrite surface. Pyrite is a really abundant mineral that is found in huge amount in the deep sea, for example. And why choosing pyrite? Because the formation of pyrite produces energy that can be used by molecules that were formed uh, on the pyrite surface uh, for metabolic purpose and to evolve so that uh, pyrite forms on its surface molecules, organic molecules aggregates. These molecules um, used the energy released by the accretion of the pyrite crystals to produce uh, organic compound uh, in an autotrophic way, creating a chemoautotrophic system that, according to Dr. Schuzer theory, is based mainly on carbon fixation with an inverse Krebs cycle. We will speak about the inverse Krebs cycle in the next uh, lesson. 
what is important to, under, to underline is that the life is not just a metabolic cycle as proposed in this way by uh, Walter Schuster, because uh, it uh, completely ignore the role of genes and of inheritance. Moreover, um, the high temperature needed for the formation of pi rays and released, the high amount of energy released by the formation of pi rays is uh, quite uh, um, uh, incompatible with some of the compounds that has common, commonly uh, thought to be necessary for the living organism because they the high temperature will boil everything that will aggregate and form on the surface. So it's an interesting theory, but there's really some, uh, uh, some drawback. Came into the uh, uh, to, to the, to the replication, so not on metabolism, but on uh, 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 replication, we can speak about Eigen theory. Eigen theory. Uh, states that starting from a chemical evolution, we go through a biological evolution when the first cell was created. And according to Eigen, the information storage system was RNA. And we choose RNA because RNA has a double function. As I already told to you, RNA can be, um, can be used both in a metabolic cycle as RNA can form ribozymes, a form of RNA enzyme, and both on the um, inheritance point of the cycle, in an inheritance cycle, because RNA is a, a genetic material as we absolutely know it uh, um, also nowadays. So according to Eigen, um, there, is, there was an hyper cycle in which RNA who catalyzed some metabolic uh, reaction and this metabolic reaction could in turn catalyze the formation of the same RNA that would catalyze the considered metabolic reaction. This is the concept of the hypercycle. And this um, cycle, as I have described to you, is a self-sustaining cycle. So it can self-sustain and replicate, and um, it can produce, starting from RNA to can produce enzyme, and then it can produce cell under reaction of the chemical evolution and then of selection and then of a biochemical uh, selection that led uh, ultimately to a uh, biological selection, as we know from uh, Darwin's uh, laws. Uh, Lastly, I would underline that uh, serial induced symbiosis was a really concerning process in first living organism. I mean that certain uh, eukaryotic organelles, such as mitochondria, chloroplast, evolved from prokaryotic endosymbionts, incorporating um, prokaryotic organism in other prokaryotic organisms. That is to say that at first, prokaryotic organisms were present on the Earth's surface. These prokaryotic organisms fused together and led to eukaryotic cell as we now uh, know. For this reason, for the reason for which uh, we had a fusion, a com continuous fusion of different eukaryotic and prokaryotic uh, cell, the one with each other, we can't just for us speak of one single LUCA as I define, but we can speak as I uh, as I did, of a ring of life, a sort of a confused system in which different 
prebiotic cell coexists and then evolve, leading to the organism that nowadays are present in the uh, living uh, world, as we know. Um, I have uh, finished, uh, not and so uh, I, Professor Daniele Dondi, I don't know if he's online. Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. So thank you, Mary, for this uh, nice presentation. So you spoke about many things all together, so the possible theories. Uh, so nice. I hope that uh, this open uh, the uh, people for a uh, speech or asking some uh, curiosities uh, about uh, all the, the topics that you touched. So we are open for uh, the discussion. Question. In this lesson or in the future lesson, if uh, you want to be more sure of some theories, yes, I have. Now, Daniele, I was thinking, uh, uh, do you think uh, it's a good idea to leave the slides? So uh, do you want to leave the slides to students or not? Yes, absolutely. I will give you a PDF uh, yes. version yes. of the slide. Okay, great. So maybe I will create a... Uh, some Google Drive so we can share the documents even for the recordings. So yes, you can contact us also by mail if you want, also if you have a curiosity or if, if you have something to, to ask in the future, you can just uh, write us a mail or contact in other ways that we will be happy to answer if we know to your uh, questions, if you are able. Yes, sure. Yes. So I can, uh, uh, if nobody has questions, we can uh, leave the sessions and uh, see you next time. That will be when? When will be next lesson? Uh, I think Thursday. 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 Thursday.